Hey, if you brought your Bibles or you brought an electronic device, go ahead and take and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. We're in Mark today. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 7. The rate we're going, we'll probably finish the chapter by the end of the year. So, that's exciting stuff. Right? We're going to be looking at verses 24 uh, down to verse 30 today. So, uh, be finding your spot there. And I'm going to read these few verses aloud for us. And you follow along your copy of God's Word. The Bible says, He got up and departed from there to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. But he could not escape notice. Instead, verse 25, immediately after hearing about him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she was asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, verse 27, let the children be fed first because it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she replied to him, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, <clears throat> because of this reply, go. The demon has left your daughter. And in verse 30, when she went back to her home, she found her child lying on the bed and the demon was gone. Lord, we come to you this morning with great expectation that you're going to show up and meet us here and move in mighty and powerful ways. Lord, I have nothing to offer this church. By way of word today, I've got uh, nothing to give if you don't meet us here. Father, would you show up and work in our hearts and in our lives, and by the power of your Spirit, would you convict us of sin and righteousness? Would you compel us to respond to the Word today? Lord, as we prepare to gather around the table later this morning, Father, we love you. Pray that you'd have your way in our hearts today, in Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Amen. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, was a great leader from India, spiritual leader. You, you've probably heard that, heard that name before, Gandhi. Uh, the story is told that early in, in Gandhi's life, earlier in Gandhi's life, uh, he was obviously from a spiritual uh, ethnic Indian background. And so he was not a follower of Jesus. But one day, uh, Gandhi sat down and he read through the Gospels. And he had decided that he needed to go and see a pastor. He needed to go to a church because he wanted to be saved. And when he arrived at that church that day looking for a pastor, someone to talk to that would advise him on how to become a Christian, he walked in and the ushers looked at him and they would not seat him because they thought it more appropriate for him to go and worship with, quote unquote, his people. And so they sent him away. And Gandhi remained in that state the rest of his life, essentially saying that if the, if the Christians had that sort of classism, and if Christians had that sort of uh, racism, that he didn't want any part of it. Today our text is going to address this idea of favoritism within the church. Because, um, like it or not, there is favoritism that goes on in the church. And I'm not just talking about in these four walls of this building. We are the church. You and I are the church. The ones in whom the Holy Spirit of the living God dwells if you are a follower of Jesus. And therefore, what I'm saying today is that we have a problem with favoritism 
And you, you, can, you can label that however you want. You could call it racism. You could call it uh, uh, classism. You could call it an issue with uh, ethnicities that are different than ours or different nationalities than ours. Wh whatever you want to call it. There is uh, still today a, a prevalent problem of favoritism within the church. And the way that I know that is because the church is comprised of people and people are sinners. Okay? And, and so if, if sinners are gathered together, there's going to be disunity, there's going to be disloyalty, there's going to be hatred, there's going to be uh, uh, disgruntledness, there's, there's going to be this disagreement within the church because the church is full of sinners. Okay? And, and, and so we shouldn't be shocked by this. But we should come to the Bible and allow the Word of God to refine our hearts and our minds and our lives to prevent us from ever being that church that sees someone walk through those doors and turns them away because we don't like how they look, how they talk, the way they act, what they believe, or how they smell, or anything else. We've got to let the Word of God work on our hearts in that way today. The further we get into Mark, the more Mark is going to be, begin to do heart surgery on us. And I think he's started to do that in the last number of weeks. It seems like God, God is just by His Spirit coming in and laying us bare and dealing with some very difficult subjects. And don't worry, there are more difficult subjects to come. So, let's just hang together and let's, let's, let's just hunker down. Let's preach through these and let's see what God's going to do. Because I have, I have high hopes for what He's up to today. As we come to this narrative, Jesus uh, is... Is, 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 has been dealing with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were this group of, of spiritual elites, the, the men that were supposed to be the teachers of the Bible, the ones that were supposed to know the law better than anybody else. And, and they were supposed to be the ones that not only know the law, but are the ones who have achieved the law and have, quote unquote, uh, fulfilled the law. They're supposed to be the, the, the cream of the crop. In terms of God's people. And yet, Jesus has just gotten through discussing how these Pharisees, in, in the first part of chapter 7, um, are actually the exact opposite of what they claim to be. But rather than being spiritual leaders, he calls them hypocrites. Okay? In the first and only time that that word is used in the Gospel of Mark, he calls the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the hypocrites. And today what he's going to do, I love this, is that he's going to contrast the favoritism and the, the, the ugliness in the hearts of these religious leaders with the humility of a woman that, quite honestly, isn't even one of God's people. One of God's Old Testament elect nation, Israel. So let's take a look at this text, and, and I hope that your heart is ready uh, I believe that I'm, I've prepared my heart for this. So let's see what, what God has in store. As we, as we come into verse 24, it says that he got up and departed from there to the region of Tyre. Now, where is there is the question. Jesus has been ministering in this place called Galilee. Uh, in a little town called Capernaum, Jesus set up his ministry headquarters in small town uh, Galilee, small town Oklahoma, kind of the idea. And he, he's been ministering all over this region. Well, now he's going to make his way north to a city uh, in, in a region called Tyre. Now, there's something you need to know about uh, the region of Tyre. The region of Tyre would have been culturally the enemy of the Israelites. Jesus is, has just moved into enemy territory. He just walked into Austin, Texas. Are you tracking with me? It, 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 this is a very ugly place, okay? And, and, and as he arrives there in Austin or Tyre, he, he uh, wants probably some rest. I mean, think about it. Jesus has been up pretty much day and night healing people. He's been ministering. He's been teaching his, his disciples who are increasingly, time and time again, proving themselves to be inept. And, and so he, he's been busy. Jesus goes into this house, it says, because he wants to find some rest. Okay? And, and here's what's amazing about this. He goes in and it says that even in this pagan, uh, idolatrous, lost city of Tyre, it says that he could not escape notice. 
Jesus has gained a reputation even amongst the people that uh, are against him, are absolute enemies. Did you know uh, in the Old Testament, one of the times that, that this city, Tyre, is mentioned is in Joel chapter 3. And it says that uh, Joel is condemning the city of Tyre because they stole all of Israel's things and they sold the Israelites into slavery. Okay? These are bad guys. But even amongst these bad, this bad culture, they can't help but take note when Jesus shows up. When Jesus is around, it says that he could not escape notice. And so, it says in verse uh, 25, that immediately after hearing about him, you can imagine the buzz that's gone on. People are sending text messages to all of their friends. They're starting Facebook Live videos as Jesus walks into town. And this woman sees on her, on her Facebook timeline that Jesus has just come into town. And now, th this is a lost pagan woman, no doubt about it. She's identified as a Gentile. Okay? Matthew's account of this, he actually calls her a Canaanite. She is a Syrophoenician by birth. She is the opposite of the people of God. And yet she sees Jesus. This Jesus that no doubt she's heard about. And she thinks this man could be the only hope that I have for my daughter. See, the, the Bible says that her daughter had an unclean spirit. The unclean spirit is later identified in, in verse 26 as a demon. She's possessed. Think about, um, don't, don't think about Hollywood pictures of, of possession. Think about biblical picture of possession. What does that mean for this young girl? Maybe she's begun, uh, maybe it started out as kind of a slippery slope. She began just to, to, to begin to act a little differently. She wasn't herself. She wasn't enjoying the, uh, the, the, her friends and her family and her uh, playtime like she used to. And suddenly, uh, maybe she began to, to, to harm herself in her body, or maybe she began to uh, try to throw herself into the fire occasionally. Maybe this, this, this girl has set out on a path of self-destruction because of this demon within her, and this mama, whose heart is breaking, sees and hears about Jesus, and thinks, this is my only chance. So the text says that immediately, this woman came and fell at Jesus' feet. Can you imagine what an awkward moment that would have been? For this woman to burst into somebody's house where this man that she's never met is sitting and fall at his feet, begging him to help her daughter. Can you imagine how awkward that must have been for her? But she didn't care because Jesus was her only hope. So she came and she fell at his feet and and she began asking him over and over that he would cast the demon out of her daughter help my daughter please Jesus help her help her now here's the thing let me back out for just a second whenever you look at a, at a narrative in the Bible there are certain cues that can tell you what the narrative is about okay when you break apart a narrative in the Bible which is what this is it's a story you, you begin to see, you, you look for certain things. And one of the things, one of the most important things that you can look for when you're interpreting a, a narrative is a moment that they call the crisis moment. In just about every narrative, there's a moment where uh, the story was being explained, everything was great, and now there's a twist. There's a, there's a shift in the focus and something is wrong. There's a problem that has been posed that needs to be addressed. Now, here's, here's the, the wonderful thing about this narrative. The crisis in this narrative is not that some woman came to Jesus and fell before his feet. Okay? The crisis in this moment is not, believe it or not, that the woman had a daughter who was demon-possessed. Why? Because we've seen that time and time again. People fall at Jesus' feet all the time. Uh, possessed men and women came to Jesus all the time asking for help. That's not the crisis. The crisis in this narrative is not that a woman came and fell at Jesus' feet, but it's who the woman is that came and fell at Jesus' feet. Take a look. You can just see the emphasis. It says in verse 26, the woman was a Gentile. She was a Syrophoenician 
by birth. This woman is not one of God's elect nation. She's not an Israelite. She has no claim to fall before Jesus' feet. She has no right, the way that they would understand it, to fall at Jesus' feet and ask anything of him. And yet, here she is. You know, uh, Matthew actually describes her as a Canaanite. You remember the Old Testament? Who were the, the Canaanites? The Canaanites were in there with the Girgashites and, and all those other termites. You remember? Okay. The Canaanites were bad people as well. The Canaanites were the enemies of God. This woman is one of God's enemies. And yet here she is falling on her feet, or falling on the feet of Jesus, begging him for help. The crisis is not the possession. And the main thrust of this narrative, quite honestly, is not that Jesus cast a demon out of this woman. It's that, this, that Jesus deals with this woman at all. See, at the end of the day, we think that, well, certain people need Jesus. Do you ever look at somebody and you think, well, that person's got it all together. They don't really need to hear, to hear about Jesus. They've got it all pulled together. You ever look at somebody, here's one for you. Maybe it's a little closer to home. You ever look at somebody and say, that person doesn't deserve to hear about Jesus. The need for Jesus transcends racial, ethnic, National, socioeconomic, gender barriers, any barrier you can come up with. The need for Jesus transcends it. Amen. You can build walls all you want. We can build walls and we can try to keep people out. And we can try to hoard this message of the gospel for ourselves. But at the end of the day, every person that we know needs Jesus. Right. And here's this woman falling at Jesus' feet. Knowing who she is, knowing who he is, knowing where she came from, knowing whom Jesus came from, and not letting any of that stop her because she needed him. She needed him. And so she comes to him. But I want us to take a look because this is where the controversy starts. And this is quite honestly, for me, the thing that I've struggled with all week long is Jesus' response to her. Take a look at this. Look at verse 27 in the text. It says that he said to her, let the children be fed first because it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, Matthew actually gives uh, some more detail. He, Matthew explains who Jesus is talking about when he says children and when he says dogs. Matthew actually explains that right before that, Jesus draws the parallel between the children and Israel. He's saying the children are those that I've come for. Israel are those that I've come for. But not the dogs. All you other people. Not the Gentiles. This, this looks like, listen, let's just call spade a spade. This looks like a very harsh response. This looks out of character for Jesus, does it not? This looks almost, and, and which by the way tells us that this is 100% accurate because who would include that? Okay, if this were not inspired. And yet, it's here. And we have to figure it out because I've struggled with this all week. What was Jesus thinking? What did he mean? Was he being the racist that we decry? Was he being the, the nationalist that we look down upon? I mean, is that what Jesus' mentality was right there? Let me just tell you in short, no. That wasn't it at all. But... At the end of the day, when he called the Gentiles a dog, when he looked at this woman and called her a dog, I don't care what culture you're in, you're in that's offensive. Okay? Especially in first century Judaism. They didn't do this stuff with their dogs today where they like dress them up and paint their toenails for them. Okay? If you're going to do it, do it for a dog, not a cat. But don't... I know, I'm, well, I'm, I'm going to get scolded for that. I'm going to get an email. But listen... He just called this lady a dog. That, in any culture, in any context, is offensive. But you know, I think uh, if we look at it in the context of the culture, it may make a little bit more sense. Because while calling someone a dog is offensive, in their context, what they would do is feed the adults, feed the children, and then the scraps would go to the dogs. Jesus is making the point, something that Paul touches on in Romans, 
where it really unpacks in Romans. That Jesus came first for the Jew and then to the Gentile. But he came for all of them. Okay? And, and his earthly mission was no doubt to come as the Jewish Messiah. And he's reorienting this woman as to tell her that, hey, you know, at the end of the day, I didn't come for the Gentiles right now. I came for the Jews. And so it's, it's hard for us. It's kind of like, have you ever sent a text message and then somebody misinterpreted your text message because they didn't understand the tone? It's sort of like that. I think if we don't have all of the context, it's hard for us to interpret this properly. And I'll be honest, it's hard to span the sea of time to get back into that context. But it, it's sort of like this. One time we were raising money for a, uh, a water well in South Sudan at my home church. And so uh, the youth pastor had left in the middle of this project, so I kind of stepped in and I, I took over the project and was kind of spearheading it. Well, one day we had to raise $10,000 for this water well. So this was a big undertaking. Okay? And so we're raising the money, and one day we get a check for like $8,000. It pushes us over. We, we came up with $15,000 for this water well. And I was so excited that day. I immediately got on, on the website for this company, that, this ministry that goes out and, and uh, drills these wells in South Sudan. I sent them this big letter telling them all about how we had raised $15,000, and it was so exciting, and everything was great. And then I signed the email with the thing that I, I always signed my e emails with. I said, in Christ, Duncan Blackwell. Has your phone ever auto-corrected you? Because at the end of that email, I signed it. I'm Christ, Duncan Blackwell. I, I just know somebody was sitting in a meeting that day and said, guys, Jesus just gave us 15 grand. Okay. If, if they didn't have the context of autocorrect, they probably would have been horrified by that. Okay? If you don't have proper context, it's easy for us to misinterpret. I think, listen, I think if we go over and read Mark's, or Matthew's account of this, I think it'll give us a proper tone for how this conversation really played out. Rather than Jesus casting this poor woman to the side. Over in Matthew 15, keep your, keep your thumb in Mark there. Sounded more like this, I think. It says, just then a Canaanite woman came from that region and kept crying out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. This is verse 22. <clears throat> my daughter is severely tormented by a demon. Jesus did not say a word to her. Your translation may say ignored. I think that misses the mark a little bit. I, I, think, I think that th the idea there is that he paused. And he looked at this woman as she's begging him, help my daughter. And he's looking down at her, knowing that his mission is for the Gentiles. And yet, he pauses. His disciples come to him and they begin to say, send her away because she's crying out after us. She's, she's getting on our nerves. Send her on, Jesus. And yet Jesus is sitting there just looking at her. And it says that he replied, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She said, Lord, help me, as she fell on her, on her knees. And in verse 25, or verse 26, it says, It isn't right to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. She says, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And he looked at her and said, Woman, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you have asked. I think what we get here is a far gentler picture of Jesus than a cursory reading of this would show us. And he says, because of your reply, go, back in Mark here, the demon has left your daughter. Because of your reply. What does he mean by that? This is a Gentile woman pursuing a Jewish Savior. Because she was willing to put everything else aside and come and take anything that He would give her. She got what she asked for. Sometimes we come to Jesus and we have these high expectations of what we deserve. And yet Jesus is saying, no, you come and you take what I give you. That's the heart of the person that's seeking after me. She said, I don't need a big banquet. I don't need a steak. I don't need fine wine. I don't need a banquet hall. I don't 
need a big party. I'll take the crumbs that fall off your table if they come from Jesus. Listen, the need for Jesus transcends all of those boundaries. But I want you to hear today that the grace of Jesus also transcends socioeconomic, gender, racial, uh, ethnic boundaries. All of them. We, we get so caught up on where someone came from and what they've been through and we begin to pass judgments on them like, well, they don't deserve to hear about Jesus. Or they don't need to hear about Jesus because they're all high and mighty. Or, or that person's too lowly to hear about Jesus. Listen to me today. It does not matter where you came from as long as you come to Jesus. And it doesn't matter where anybody came from as long as we're inviting them to Jesus. We have no right to show favoritism in the church. Racism has no place. Classism has no place among the people of God because those things destroy unity within the church. We're about to participate in communion here in just a few minutes. Communion, the heart of communion is unity. That we commune together. And, and favoritism destroys unity. So I've got today the ABCs of unity within the church. Ready? A, acknowledge our status before God. If this church will be unified, if the men and the women and the children of God will be unified, working in one direction for one purpose, then first we will acknowledge our standing before God. Who's seen the movie Remember the Titans? Okay, you guys need to watch movies. Okay. <laughs> And remember the Titans, it's this, uh, this, this basically story about the, the racial tensions when schools began to integrate. And Denzel Washington comes on the scene and he's the new football coach at this team that's historically been at this school that's a, historically been a white school. And so he comes in and they're about to get on the bus and the star player, Gary, walks up to him and he says, Hey coach, I just want you to know uh, I'm an all-state all uh, quarterback and if you want me to play for you, you're going to reserve half the spots on this team for our people, and we don't need any of your kind on defense. And he leaned into him, Denzel did, you can just see Denzel Washington, leaned into him and said, hey Gary, is your mama here? She said, he said, yeah, right over there. He said, oh, that's sweet. Do you know when you get on that bus, you don't have a mama no more. You've got your brothers, and you've got your daddy. He said, hey Gary, you know who your daddy is, don't you? He said, Gary, who's your daddy? He said, you are a coach. He said, go ahead and say it, Gary. Who's the daddy? He said, you are a coach. He said, now get on the bus. Listen, if we're going to be a part of this team, we've got to acknowledge that there is no distinction between you or me or anybody else in the church of Jesus Christ. That the ground is very level at the foot of the cross of Jesus. And that when we come here, there is no one that's greater and no one lesser, but rather we are all bowing in subjection to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. So we acknowledge our status before God. That's the first step. If we haven't done that, then everything else falls short. Because if you haven't done that, quite honestly, you may not know Jesus. We acknowledge our status. We be bow before Jesus. We bow before Him. You know, when Mark wrote this gospel account, do you know who informed him, his source for th this information? It was the Apostle Peter. Very likely. Very likely the Apostle Peter is the one that told Mark all these stories and, and, and narrated to him as he was writing some of them. Okay? And so I think it's interesting that Peter would include this because you remember in Galatians 2 what Paul said about Peter? Paul said about Peter in Galatians 2 that, that I, I, I went down and I was hanging out with Cephas one day, another name for Peter. And Peter had this practice of eating with the Gentiles. Everything was great in the church until some Jews showed up with Jesus' brother James. And uh, suddenly he started casting the Gentiles to the side and eating only with the Jews. Paul stood up and called him out on it. He said, this is ridiculous. This doesn't belong in the church of Jesus Christ, Peter. And yet here's Peter including this, uh, this narrative as he's talking to Mark about favoritism. You want to see what it looks like to bow yourself before Jesus? Peter did it. Peter was willing to lay down his favoritism, lay down what he thought to, he knew to be true, willing to lay down his own uh, uh, hard beliefs and his dogmatic beliefs in order to live in fellowship with the Lord's 
a church, with the, the church of Jesus Christ. That's what it looks like to bow before the Lord. It's transformation. And that's what it takes. That's what this woman came and did. She fell at his feet. She bowed before him. Listen, I think today there are some of us in here that maybe need to bow ourselves before the Lord Jesus. You ever look at people and think you're either better than them or they're better than yours? Hey, listen, at the end of the day, you need to bow in subjection to Jesus. And I firmly believe if we acknowledge who we are before God and who God is before all men, then, then we'll have no problem bowing before Jesus because we know who, just who He is. So we A, acknowledge our status before God. We B, bow before Jesus. And lastly, we C, care for our enemies. This woman's a Syrophoenician Gentile, an enemy of God. She, she's from the people who used to sell the Judeans for money and profit. And yet she falls before Jesus needing help. And what does he do? It says in the text, it says that he looked at her and said, the demon has left your daughter. That's written in such a way that, hey, while you were talking, I cast the demon out of her from right here. And guess what? The demon was gone then, the demon is gone now, and the demon will stay gone because I said so. He helped her. She went home and found it to be true. The demon was gone. It's written in the same exact way. The demon was gone. The demon is gone. The demon will stay gone because of the word of Jesus. He cared for her even though she was an enemy. And you know what we need in the church is care for our enemies. What about the atheist? What about the Muslim? What about the Buddhist? What about the spiritualist? What about all the people that we like to label the enemy that desperately need Jesus? There is no room for that. If we do that, then I, I firmly believe the church of Jesus Christ in the United States will crumble and God will withdraw His Spirit from the, the, this place. Not from us individually as Christians, but certainly the Spirit of God will not continue to ordain and to work in a people that refuse, that refuse to love the enemy. Here's an interesting take on this. A man named uh, Daryl Davis is a black man who years ago befriended a member, a high-ranking member of the KKK. This man hated Daryl, but Daryl was willing to talk to him and love him. Do you know that? It, it really is. You can, you can look up his story on, on Facebook, YouTube. He loved this man in spite of himself. He loved this man so much that this man began to love him back. This man began to love him back so much that he laid down his KKK membership. Daryl Davis loved and befriended over 200 members of the KKK after that. Because he was willing to care for the enemy. Listen to me today. Here's something that, that we need to hear and that you might need to hear. Do you know there's hope for the racist? Yeah. Yeah, there is. We hear a whole lot about how there's not. There is. If we will love them. And if we will treat them with the love of Jesus and preach the gospel into their lives, I promise you, God can save them just like He saved me. If He can save my sorry soul, He can save anybody. We're to care for the enemy. There's hope for any person that you can see, any person that you interact with, even the, th think of the cruelest person that you know. There's hope for that man or that woman. And they can come into this fellowship and God can break down barriers that they've built in their lives. God can break down barriers that they've built in their minds. God can do amazing, miraculous works in the lives of those who would surrender to Him so that they too could participate in the table. This morning, we're going to participate in the Lord's Supper. And here's the thing. We didn't have our prayer time at the beginning of the service because I want to have it now. We need to prepare our hearts for this. This is a time that, hey, quite honestly, we haven't been able to have in months here. Because of the pandemic, because these little prepackaged cups were sold out for months. Okay? 
for, for lots of reasons, but we're doing it now. And here's the thing. You need to prepare your heart to lay down divisions and barriers that are between yourself and God and yourself and your fellow believer. It's not lost on me that we might look across this room today and see somebody that we are at odds with. You might look across this room today and see somebody that, hey, you know, quite honestly, the last time we talked was very ugly and we've never reconciled. You know what you need to do today, maybe during this time of reflection? If you want to come down here and pray at the steps, you're welcome to do that while Spencer sings. But maybe what you need to do is go across the aisle today. Maybe go to the back of the room or to the front of the room today and grab somebody by the hand and say, hey, I just want you to know you wronged me, but I'm praying through it to forgive you. Or I wronged you and I'm so sorry. Maybe that's what we need today. It's just some reconciliation. The whole idea behind communion is communing with God and with one another. This is the Lord's Supper. We'd better not enter into it flippantly, but we better take this very seriously. So here's what we'll do. You've got some time to pray here, okay? Just a few minutes of Spencer through, sings through this song. I want to invite you to do that. If you want to come kneel at these steps, if you want to kneel right where you are, just bow your head. If you want to go talk with somebody, you're welcome to do all of those things. But here's the deal. Here at Bethel, we practice close communion. That's what it's called, okay? You don't have to be a member at Bethel to participate in the Lord's Supper, but you do have to be a born-again believer who has been baptized after your salvation, okay? who's in good standing with a local church somewhere. That's what we ask. And so, uh, and, and more than anything, we ask that for your benefit. There are some serious uh, consequences laid out in Scripture for those who take the Lord's Supper flippantly. We don't want to do that. But I want to give you a time of reflection. If you are born again, if you know Jesus, if after you came to know Jesus, you've been baptized, and you're in a local church, feel free to participate with us today. I'm going to pray for you, and then we'll open it up for this time of reflection. Spencer's going to sing through a song. I'm not going to belabor it, but let God work in your heart today. And then we'll ask the deacons to come forward. Father, I pray for each of us. God, that we would lay down the hindrances that we have in our hearts. Lord, that you would tear down the walls that we've built in our hearts. Whatever those look like, however ugly it may be, Father, would you have your way in our lives today? During this time of reflection, would you convict us of sin and of righteousness? Would you convict us of, of disunity within the body of Christ? Would you compel us to lay those things down, to be reconciled with our brother or sister? God, we need you now. In Jesus' name. Amen.